got nervous, and if so, that button before. Okay, I just want to give a quick um, couple of pointers on the end of Chapter 7. What's the difference between a male and female skeleton? Why? Baby head needs to go through big hole. Yes? So women's pelvis, coxal bones, and the coxal bones are actually made up of three bones. The ilium, big part. You sit on your ischium and the pubis. Ilium, ischium, pubis. What's this? And what's it called? I don't know, it's cartilage. It's called the where the two pubic bones meet. Pubic symphysis. Yes. What kind of cartilage is it? Is it also called the arch? Not yet. We're not there yet. Yes, it is. Fibro cartilage. And synthesis is correct. It's fibrocartilage. It's got a little bit, and we'll talk about this when we talk about joints. Okay? So when I look at the coxal bones, um, males tend to have larger bones in general. Okay? Because they tend to have larger what? Muscles. Larger bones, larger muscles. Now, if you look at this here, this is called the pubic arch, where the symphysis joins the two bones. We create an angle here called the pubic arch. In the male, the pubic arch, and this is a math thing, so don't get scared, is less than 90 degrees. You see what I'm doing with my fingers? If I go up and down like this, that's a 90 degree angle. So yes? It's cute. Angle. It's cute. It's acute. It's, a, it's acute. Yes? So it's less than 90 degrees. Do you see that here? Because it's less than 90 degrees, this area called the pelvic brim tends to be much smaller. In the female, the coxal bones are lighter, a little bit lighter. Coxal, again, being a combination of three bones, right? And what happens to the pubic arch? It's no longer less than 90 degrees. It's actually, it's greater than 90 degrees. Obtuse. Thank you very much. And because of the way these bones meet, it creates what? A much larger pelvic brim. And what's that for? Baby heads, very good. Okay, so women and the size of the baby that they can deliver is dependent on their pelvic brim. You can have a 90 degree woman soaking wet and she can pop those babies out no problem if her pelvic brim is large enough. Okay, so that is what doctors look at when baby is developing as to whether or not they can be delivered naturally. One of the things they use to determine that. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, sometimes they refer to it as that. This, this space here. Okay? Now with the picture where the, uh, the caustics and the sacrum are. The picture? Is that, is that actually a hole like this or is it like this from here? It looks like it's just a U shape. But it's actually. Oh, no, it's circular. It's like this. The pelvic brim is a big round circle, yep, a, or a bowl. That's a nice way to describe it, right? So understand the difference between male and female pelvis. That's how I can tell the difference. So when you go into the lab and the skeleton comes out next week, except for you guys who have lab on Tuesday, tell me whether it's a male or a female. How, what are you going to do? 
There's other things. There's other bone, bone markings that determine the difference between male and female. But that's the quickest and easiest way to figure it out. Okay, so that's your homework for those of you who have lab. Because I'm going to ask you that question. What's the, what is the skeleton upstairs, male or female? All right? Um, again, this is a what view? Inferior view. So we can see the sacrum and the coccyx. Sometimes during childbirth, what might happen while well, big head is coming out this way? Might get hung up on that little guy and possibly even get a little break. Yeah, yep, yep, that happens. And then lower limbs, femur, largest, longest, strongest bone. How do I tell it's a femur? I can tell by some really distinct characteristics. Very long neck and head at which aspect of the bone? Proximal, distal. The distal end has a very distinct frontal sur surface on the anterior portion of the bone called the patellar surface. It's nice and smooth. And guess what sits in that region? The patella that looks like an almond. Yes? That's a sesamoid bone. That's this guy here. See how nice and smooth the posterior aspect is? Because it sits right here on the patellar surface and slides nicely. What kind of cartilage is there? Slick, slippery ends of bones. Highland cartilage. Slide. Yes? When I want to hold tight so you don't move so much, different cartilage. When I want you to slide, highland cartilage. So Make sense? But in between femur and the, uh, the, the tibia and fibula, that's fibrocartilage. You have a whole bunch of different kinds of cartilage there. At the ends of the bones, it, and we're talking about knee joint, and we'll talk about that when we talk joints, you can find a whole bunch of different stuff there. You have ligaments that cross and hold on to bones. Your meniscus is fibrocartilage. Yeah, and then you have on the end of the bone in the knee joint, on the ends of the femur, and then who else? Who's down in the lower leg? The tibia and the fibula at the tops. You're going to have articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage. So you find a whole bunch of stuff in the knee. So the lower bones, tibia and fibula, this is the lateral look at these bones coming from this way, yes? Bend down and touch this little thing, the sticky outy thing, and you girls know that this is a real pain in the keister when you shave, yeah? You're always getting bloody there, right? What is that? It's called the lateral malleolus of the what? The fibula. The fibula. Inside, you've got another little sticky outy thing not as prominent as the outside sticky outy thing. That's called the medial malleolus of the what? Tibia. Is that part of the ankle? Yep. Well, the, that's tough question. It's, it leads to the ankle. The ankle bones are what? Tarsals. Tarsals. Very similar to who? Carpals. Okay. Right in here, that oh, knee. Well, see, when you think of the ankle, a lot of us are pointing to these malleoluses, lateral and medial, too. But the, the reason you can do that is because of the tarsals that join or articulate with these guys. Yes? How many tarsals do you have? Seven. How many metatarsals do you have? Five. How many phalanges? Same word, do you have in your feet? Each foot has how many phalanges? What did we say about the hand? Fourteen. Ready? One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm not taking the shoes off, same thing. So the big toe has, exactly, hmm, they're very similar, aren't they? Feet and hands, hmm. So the big toe is like your thumb, two bones, phalange bones, and then the other guys are like the rest of your fingers, three phalange bones apiece. Even that little minuscule baby toe has three phalange bones. The, the furthest away from the midline is distal, the one in the middle is medial, and the one closest to the midline is proximal. Yes? So that's the foot. So when I look at the foot, the shape of the foot, it's important to remember that those bones just don't lie flat. When, when things are straight, they don't give you a lot of bounce and support. Anybody flat-footed in the class? So you don't have as prominent a group of what we call arches. So the bones are arranged so that they create these arches. Medial longitudinal, you should know what that means transverse and lateral longitudinal arches. This is going to allow you to have a little bounce. This is going to allow you to be able to stand on your feet for long periods of time. People with flat feet, can you stand on your feet long periods of time without consequence? No. What's the consequence? Pain. You start to get aches and pains in your lower limbs, even, even might run up into your lower back because of all the nerve endings that feed in from those regions. So those arches are important. And then you got all the rest of the little tables you need to know. What's this? It's a baby skull. It's a baby skull. When babies are born, um, <laughs> no, I, I thought there was a baby picture there. But that's a, that's a picture of a, a child with a cleft palate that, so that maxilla doesn't form that complete palate. It, it doesn't fuse together the way it's supposed to. And there's a space there, and that leads right up into the nasal passages, and that can be an issue. This is a, in, an infant skull. Now, anybody recently have a new baby, or somebody have a new baby, or remember what a new baby looks like? They kind of look a little creepy sometimes when they first come out, right? A little ET-like, a little alien-ish. Why? Do you see the skull? They don't have no face. They have no... Yeah. So it takes a while. They have that big honking head because what's inside there? Hopefully a brain, yes? But those bones that we discussed in the adult skull have big areas where we still see a lot of cartilage that will eventually become, what are these things called? Sutures. Sutures. But if those weren't cartilage, that child, when it squeezed through that hole, would probably crack its skull. These guys almost go across each other during the childbirth process. I know it sounds But those things are called fontanelles, and they're named basically for where they are in the skull, those areas of cartilage in the infant skull, soft spot, the big huge one, that anterior fontanelle. Sometimes the little alien babies, it looks like they have a heartbeat up there, doesn't it? Yeah. What is that center one? Anterior fontanelle? Oh, don't worry about it. That's, I think, a sagittal, I think it's, this, this is a sagittal suture, so I think sagittal is in its name. Don't worry about it, though. Okay? And again, the cleft palate, it can be a problem because the nasal passage and the oral or buccal cavity should be separated by that palate. So it's going to be a problem with um, secretions coming from the nasal passage. It's going to be a problem when the child eats and having things go up into the nasal passage. You share um, the nasal passage 
respiratory system with the digestive system passageways up in the upper portion of those tubes. So that can be a problem with aspiration, getting things, solids and liquids, down into the respiratory system when we don't want them there. Yeah, at least at least two years. Okay, why did we show you this cute? Besides the cuteness of it all, how can you? Yeah, look at the little spine. Remember we had this. We we talked about the curvatures in the spinal cord. Those develop with time. When baby is born, what do we have? We have a C-shaped spine. That's why baby has a hard time doing this. Yes until they develop that first curvature so they can hold their head up. Okay, so that's how baby is born. And then as muscles develop, we develop those curvatures in the, in the ways that we should. Okay, so there's the newborn skull and the adult skull. And again, notice the face. It takes those facial bones quite some time to actually kick in. And they're going to start in here. And if anybody has any older kids or knows any older kids, they hit a certain age, and it's usually like 13, 14, 15 years old. And all of a sudden, you look at them and go, oh, they look so old. That's because they finally developed their face. Seriously, they finally got those mature facial bones in place. And that's when you see the difference between what we see as an adult and what we see as an infant or a child. Okay, so see the difference? We finally get a chin by the time we reach that human skull age. Any questions? Don't worry about that. Let's go to chapter 8. Yeah. Well, because remember, you have a frontal bone, two parietal bones. Two temporal bones, sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone, right? Lacrimal bones, all of those guys, add them all up. Okay. Everybody good with chapter seven then? Understand what you need to know? Again, the majority of your testing on chapter seven will be done in lab. Your visual identification of the bones and the bone markings that we ask you to know. That will be a lab thing. In lecture, I just want you to have a general idea of where everybody lives. I just want you to have a general idea of where everybody lives. No. I didn't say anything about essay questions. All right. So this is the last version of the book. I forgot to update the picture. That's what's his name, the diver guy or the swimmer guy. But it's, yeah, same thing. So chapter 8, we're not. I know it seems like a long chapter, but the book goes into a lot of detail on some of the major joints in the body that we are not going to go into that much detail in. I want you to know where they are, but we're not going to get crazy about that. And that's why this chapter is so long. Basically, I want you to understand some of the terminology associated with bones and joints. Joints. What's a joint? And don't be smart. It's where bones meet or join. What's another name I could use, fancy schmancy science name I could use for where bones meet? Suture is where they meet or articulate is another one. That's what I was looking for. Articulate or articulations. Now, what we're going to talk about is the different types of articulations in the human skeleton. Okay? So, the first one the book talks about is something or terms that we need to know about how movable these articulations are. So, this is kind of a vocabulary chapter. What's a synarthrosis? What's sin mean, terminology, medical terminology? Together. Sin means together, tight. Sin, if something's tightly together, does, is there a lot of movement there? It's immovable. 
So synarthrosis is an immovable joint. Amphiarthrosis. Slightly movable. Give me an example of an amphiarthrosis. Moves a little bit, not a lot. Moves a little bit, not a lot. Yeah, spinal cord. Where we find some of that fibrocartilage, we're going to get a little movement. We're not going to get a lot. The pubic symphysis is an example also of an amphiarthrosis. Yeah, the costal cartilage. That's more, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what you would call that. Um, it moves a lot more than an amphiarthrosis does. Yeah. Yeah, but you can get, you, if you breathe in really deeply, you can get a lot more movement than in a, in a, in a typical amphiarthrosis between the costal cartilage and the ribs. All right, and the third term we need to know is a diarthrosis, a freely moving joint. Usually when we see the term diarthrosis, we're going to be referring to joints called synovial joints. So every time we see a diarthrosis in the body, no matter how small it is, no matter how small the bones are, we're talking about some sort of synovial joint, which we'll discuss in a moment. So know those terms. The first thing the book starts talking about are fibrous joints. Fibrous joints have what kind of holding them? Fibrous tissue. Either dense, regular, or dense, irregular connective tissue. Fibrocartilage is what we might see in some of these regions. So fibrous joints don't give us tons and tons of movement, and some of them don't give us any movement at all. For example, sutures. Do we want a lot of movement in our sutures? Probably not a good thing for the brain. So a suture, here's another term we need to know, is a syndesmosis. So you can kind of, these, these words are sort of interchangeable. A sin arthrosis is sort of interchangeable with a sin desmosis, right? Sin, sin, yes, immovable, suture. What's a sin ostosis? It's, it's a literal bone connection. Give me an example of a sin ostosis. We talked about it when we talked about long bones. Growth in long bones. Place where growth happens in long bones. It no longer does happen in, human, in adult humans. Yeah, remember when we called the growth plate when it turned into a synostosis, the growth plate is no longer the growth plate, it's the epiphyseal line, yes? So that might, that's a good example of that. Syndesmosis, ligament connections. Again, these are a little looser, yes? What did you call the first one, the suture? What is that again? The, the syn... The syndesmosis so, or suture. Okay, so suture and... Now, now this guy's the next guy. This is this... The excuse me. Um, yeah. I did say the same word, didn't I? Syndesmosis is, is, is um, ligaments. So I, I pre-said the word. Sorry. So suture, then syndesmosis. So suture is not a syndesmosis. A syndesmosis is connected by a ligament. Correct? I, I just corrected myself. So erase <coughs> what I said before. And a suture is a suture. Immovable. Then we have slightly movable syndesmosis. So here's where we see ligaments. 
Now again, if I look at the tibia and the fibula down there in the ankle, there's not a whole heck of a lot of movement. When I move my ankle, what's moving mostly? Yeah, the tarsal bones are kind of sliding across each other. There's not a lot of movement between the fibula and the bottom of the tibia. It's held very tightly. There's a little bit, but not tons, because we see a ligament there. And that's a syndesmosis. The other type of fibrous joint, tight, close, is something called a gomphosis. And where do we see the gomphosis? All your teeth are sitting in either the mandible or the maxilla. Are they, can you move them a little bit? Yeah. Anybody ever have braces? There's your proof, right? You can move them a little bit. Hopefully they don't move a lot. And we have to take care of those joints that are covered by this wonderful gingiva. And you see how there's kind of a space that kind of sits in the joint? What, do you, what are you supposed to do to your teeth besides brush them every day? Floss them because down in that space what likes to hide out and grow and multiply schmutz, schmutz plaque okay and that can disrupt that joint quite a bit and loosen it up and result in tooth decay and tooth loss and what runs through the center of a tooth yeah there's a blood supply there's a nerve supply when you start to break that down that's going to hurt a lot so, periodontal ligament is gomphosis, and that's going to hold that slightly moving guy in. So, those are my fibrous joints, suture, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. Now, we're going to talk about cartilage, so chondro is going to come into the word. And what's a synchondrosis? Immovable what? Cartilage joint. So when we look at the epiphyseal plate, we don't want that to move around, do we? No. That's where what happens? What kind of growth? What, what do we call it? Fancy schmancy science word. Endochondral ossification continues in that area to create a bone that is long, yes. And then we have very little movement between the sternum's manubrium, which is the top portion of the sternum, and your first rib, believe it or not. There's not a lot of movement going on there. And your first rib is right behind this bone here in your collar. Your collarbone, what's that called? Clavicle. It's right behind it. So it's very difficult to feel. So think of you opening an umbrella when you breathe in and breathe out with your rib cage. So that, see my fingers at the top? There's not a lot of movement there at the top. As we go down further, we get a little more movement. So. The other thing is a symphysis, fibrocartilage, lots of fibers, very little movement, kind of, what, will, what could we call a symphysis? Use another word. Is it a, is it a synarthrosis? No, it's a, the second one. What's the second one? No. Amphiarthrosis. So when we see the word arthrosis at the end, we're, we're, it's just a general joint term. If I throw in chondrosis, that means cartilage. So that would be amphiarthrosis? No, no. It would be an amphiarthrosis, and you would call it a symphysis. Well, that just makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah, you can call it two different things. If I talk about its range of motion, 
you can call it an amphi, what? I'm just talking about range of motion. I didn't ask you what it was made of. Yeah. You call it arthrosis. Okay? So cartilage, fibrocartilage between intervertebral discs, vertebral bones, pubic symphysis are examples. And now we get to the big one. And that big one is the synovial joint. Now all synovial joints, no matter how small or how large they are, have the same basic parts. They all are a place where bones articulate. So we have to have something that holds them, the articulating bones together. And what's that called? Some sort of ligament. And again, this is a general description of a synovial joint. Where the two bones articulate, the coverings of those bones are covered with something slick and slippery. What do we call it? Highland cartilage, or what's another name for that highland cartilage? Articular cartilage, where bones what? Articulate. So we see that inside this little capsule. The joint cavity itself that's created by those ligaments on the outside and membranes on the inside that actually make fluid, and what do we call the fluid? Synovial fluid. Those membranes are called synovial membranes, lie the inside of this capsule. It's called the articular capsule. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is that going to, if... Is that because it's trying to produce that fluid? Because the irritation is trying to produce a spot where there's no more friction? Well, it, it irritates. The, the question was build up of fluid in your knee joint. Why does that happen? Because there might be some irritation of those synovial membranes. It's causing them to overproduce fluid. Um, some infections can do that. Some arthritis can do that. So we have problems with joints when there's too much pressure in there to move them properly. So just like um, when we discuss the central nervous system, if I produce too much fluid around the brain, it causes way too much pressure and the brain can't function properly. In synovial joints, if those membranes, for whatever reason, whether it be injury, um, inflammatory process can cause that, um, or disease processes, those synovial membranes producing too much synovial fluid can cause problems with mobility in joints as well. So, all of these common parts you should know when you discuss synovial joints. So we have articular cartilage, and this is all outlined for you on page 252 in your text. Joint or articular cavity, that articular capsule which contains fluid called synovial fluid and then we have some sort of reinforcing ligaments. The more complex a joint, the more pressure a joint takes, we're going to see that there's more reinforcing ligaments. And that's what the book's going to go crazy on when they talk about the knee joint and what? The shoulder, look. Look at all the movement I have here. So I have to have a lot of reinforcing ligaments in many different directions so I can actually do that. So they'll talk about that in the book as well. What's the uh, difference between the uh, external layer of the It's finer tissue, that, that fibrous capsule, synovial membrane, very similar to the bone covering, the periosteum, when we talked about the fibrous, and what layer? There's two layers of the periosteum. Go find out. Same thing here. No, I'm not going to just tell you. You go find out. Hmm? 
No, and osteum's on the inside of the cavity. Go back. You go look. I'm not going to just tell you. You should know that already. So the fibrous capsule and synovial membrane are similar to the two layers of the periosteum, which cover the outsides of bones. They're sort of continuations of that. Ligaments and tendons are similar materials as well. Ligaments are attaching what to what? Bone to bone. And they're extensions of the periosteum. Tendon, what's that? Well, no, I, I said that the material is similar to the two layers of the periosteum when we talk about that. So what is a tendon then? It's an extension of the layer that covers muscle, the perimecium that attaches to bone. Okay? Fascia is usually some sort of tendon-like material. Okay? And there's different ones around the body that are extensions of muscle in long, long layers. We have a, a big ligament up here in the head. There's not much muscle in the head. When we talk muscles, we'll talk about those guys a little bit more. But they're extensions of those coverings, whether they be of muscle or of bone. Okay? So know all those common parts of your synovial joints. Yes, sir? Correct. Good boy. Fibrous and osteogenic. Remember we had two layers of the periosteum. The inner layer was the osteogenic layer. It was finer. And then there was a fibrous layer on the outside. Remember those Sharpies fibers we talked about? Those would be closer to the osteogenic layer. All right. The other thing that we need in a very freely moving joint is to sort of reduce friction and tension on the bones that are moving across each other. If there's a lot of ligaments and tendons in any given joint, we also need something to give them a break when they move. And what we have is something called bursa. Bursa and tendon sheaths are sort of like extra little wrappings associated with ligaments and tendons that are going to further reduce friction in a freely moving joint. When I talk about major bursa, anybody ever have bursitis? Where was it? In your shoulder. I had it in my hip. These are two major joints where the femur meets your coxal bone and all that movement happening in your shoulder. We're going to find some in the knee as well. Things that take a lot of pressure and lots of ligaments and attachments there, we're going to find these extra little decrease in pressure sacs, and they're called bursa. Bursa are like little, here I go with the hockey puck again, but little hockey pucks filled with fluid, tough though, that sit underneath some major tendons and ligaments in major joints. Exactly. So the tendons don't keep rubbing on the bone, wearing away articular cartilage, decreasing pressure and tension on the whole movement, friction. Um, tendon sheets wrap themselves around tendons. Oops. They don't show us. Yeah, there's one over there. See the tendon sheet sheath? It actually wraps around a tendon that's attaching your biceps brachii or brachii muscle, where are your biceps? So when I move, I have something that holds still and something that pulls on something else that causes a movement. This is the origin of that muscle. When we talk muscles, we'll talk these terms. And this is the insertion of that muscle. So tendons attached up in the shoulder region are holding that tight and still. So when I pick up really heavy things, there's a lot of pressure and tension on that tendon. So a tendon sheath is going to help reduce friction in that movement to happen a little bit easier. So know what a bursa and a tendon sheath is. Now the fun begins. 
basic terminology. Sort of like the language of anatomy kind of thing applied to the movement of synovial joints. So, when we talk about factors influencing stability of synovial joint, and this begins on page 255 in your textbook, some of the different things that are going to affect the movements at these joints are how they meet each other or how they articulate. That can determine a lot about how they're going to move. So the bones of your carpals are kind of little short bones, little flat things that can slide across each other. These joints and that movement are called what? Gliding joints. It's because of their articular, that's my, that's my princess wave, by the way. Um, how many ligaments are in the region? How much pressure is in the region? Muscle, muscle, muscle tone is also going to determine movement and stability at joints. When you don't use it, you lose it. The more you use it, the tighter and tauter and more efficient your movements are. One of the things that happens to patients who are bedridden for a very long time, they go to get up and what happens? <laughs> Why? They fall. Yeah, a lot of those major joints that take that pressure typically aren't being used very well and those tendons and those muscles are weakened as well. So those are very important um, factors in movements. Movements allowed by the synovial joints. And this is fun, fun little vocabulary. So we have gliding, we have angular, we have extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, rotation, supination, dorsiflexion, pronation. All of those wonderful terms starting on page 256 and all the pictures going through 258, you need to know. Okay? So, look at the pictures. They'll help you. Okay? Hyperextension, extension, flexion, <coughs> and some of the angular movements, flexion, extension, hyperextension. So look at the pictures. They'll be helpful to you. Circumduction, abduction, adduction, rotation, movement lateral, movement medial, pronation, supination. Hmm? Yeah, so think of your hand in a prone position. And then when you get up and face the sky, you're supinating. So you use the pictures to help because the pictures will jog your memory. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, pronation, retraction, protraction, elevation, depression. And this is why we're so amazing. Did you know that? Because we have what? Opposable thumbs. Now let's talk about, yes, so do monkeys. And, and um, what are the cute bear, panda bears? All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the joints that are important. These are on in your focus of synovial joints on page 260 and 261. So plane joints, or planar joints, are things that move across each other. Example, the princess wave, yes? These are moving you in different axes. So this little diagram shows you which axis you move in. In your textbook, it's outlined with the joint. So uniaxial, biaxial, multiaxial, or non-axial, stationary. 
Okay? So that's a plain joint. A hinge joint, just like a hinge of a door. Not a fancy schmancy door like a door in your house. It only goes, opens in one direction, right? Why? Because it would bang into the wall and not be able to go any further, right? In your arm, an example of a hinge joint is, what's that bone on the end? I, sh I pointed this out in chapter 7. Of the ulna, yes? Olecranon, is that ringing a bell? Yep, the olecranon process and the olecranon begins with an F. Fossa on the humerus, they bang into each other, they don't go any further than that. Hinge joint. Pivot, the reason I can do this, ready? Is because of a pivot joint at the proximal end of your radius. You know what I'm talking about? That's what it looks like. The proximal end of the radius that articulates with your humerus, yes, allows you to do this. So the bones actually cross over each other. Yep. It's at the, the distal, excuse me, the proximal end of your radius. You should know what that means. It articulates with the ulna. It actually has a, the base of it also articulates with the humerus. So when you're like this, they're crossed over. Is this right here? This is open like this. Yeah. And then they start to cross. Yes. Condyloid joint, kind of a ball and socket kind of thing, except they are oval instead of round, can be found between who and what? The metacarpals and the, those are carpals. The metacarpocarpals phalange joint. So where the metacarpals meet the phalanges, yes? So this is why you can do this, see? Woo! Because of a condyloid joint. Saddle joint, that's the amazing composable thumb joint. That's why you can do this. It's the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. Where the carpals do what? Meet the metacarpals. Yes? And then, usually more of a, what kind of axial? Multi-axial movement happens in the ball and socket joint. So your shoulder where the humerus articulates with the scapula, we have much more free movement and ball and socket joints allows for that. So know those terms. Now here's the part that I'm not going to get crazy about the rest of the chapter. Your knee joint, they go nuts. but you get an appreciation for how complex the knee joint is because this joint is one of the major ones that carries what? All the rest of you. All those bones and muscles that we're going to talk about and internal organs, they're quite heavy. So we have a lot of reinforcement going on in the knee. We have that sesamoid bone called the patella that's held by tendons we have bu a bunch of bursa, subcutaneous prepatellar bursa, and some underneath the deep infrapatellar bursa that are going to help reduce friction in all of those ligaments and tendons. And then we have little tendons and ligaments on the inside along with some fibrocartilage called the meniscus, little hockey pucks to help absorb some of that friction. The cruciate ligaments, both lateral and anterior, we're going to find there. And when you look at the base of 
this bone and this bone, we're going to see some extensions or protuberances associated with where those ligaments are attached. Remember, when they pull on bone, they're going to create thicker areas. So pay attention to that when you go into lab. You can see where those ligaments actually <coughs> attach. To the tibia, the wit what aspect of the tibia? Proximal and the distal aspect of the femur. Um, again, that meniscus is kind of like a hockey puck thing, a little slippier, slippier, slipperier than fibrocartilage typically is, but we find um, that tough meniscus helping to absorb pressure. You've probably heard a bunch of these different terms when we talk about football players getting hit. My poor Tom Brady a couple years ago, right? Anterior cruciate ligament, meniscus damage can put you out for the season. Um, yeah. So knees aren't meant to bend that way. And that can cause all sorts of problems. The shoulder, again, a, a major place of movement. We pick a lot of things up with our arms, so there's a lot of pressure there. So we find the tendon sheets and bursa to help decrease friction and tension. Bursitis, what is that? Inflammation, Inflammation of the bursa. And same with the synovial joint that we just talked about. If the bursa become inflamed, they're kind of counterproductive, aren't they? They're going to create more pressure and cause pain in a joint when they become inflamed. So that's bursitis. So we see the major shoulder joint. We see the glenoid cavity, which we find on the scapula, which is lined with some nice hyaline cartilage. And then we see tons and tons of different ligaments because of the rotation-like movement. We see uh, an area of dense ligaments we call the rotator cuff because of the movement we see at the shoulder joint. What will we need to know on that? Um, not much. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in a minute. Um, then we have some ligaments. Anybody? Uh, teeth grinder? You get pain right here. Yeah, you know why? You're not supposed to go like this. You're supposed to go like this. Yes? I can't even do it. You're not supposed to go like that. You're supposed to go like that. But once you wear down your teeth, you have to. Yeah, and if you have problems with loosening up of the temporomandibular joints, then you're going to have problems in that area. You can also wear down the enamel when you move side to side. Um, I have to wear this stupid little mouth guard at night that cost me way too much money at the dentist's because because of all you students who give me tension during the day and I grind my teeth at night. So um, that's the temporomandibular joint. So basically what I want you guys to be able to recognize from this chapter is these terms. Okay? So if I say to you, where is the intervertebral joint? You should know it's where? Between the vertebrae. Blay. If I say, where is the atlantoaxial joint? You should know it's up in the head region. You see what I'm saying? The temporomandibular, between the temporal bone and the mandible. The nice thing about this is once you learn the bones, then, uh, hello. The joints are named for the, pretty much for the bones that they're articulating with. Okay, so vertebral, costral, intervertebral, that's what you need to know. That is on page, what page is it? Yes, you need to know all of them. On page 254 and 255 in your textbook. Noted? So sternoclavicular, sternum and clavicle, sternocostal, that's costal cartilage there between the ribs and the sternum, 
So these are kind of, hopefully once you learn your bones, they're kind of a no-brainer. All right? Intercarpal, radiocarpal, between the radio and the carp, uh, radius and the carpals, etc. So know those. I'll give you one, one clicker question and then go home. So here's the deal. To recap, we are going to have a quiz on Tuesday, Chapter 8. We are going to start lecture on Chapter 11, Nervous System, Tuesday. Yep. Then on Thursday of next week, you're going to have your exam on Chapters 4, 6, 7, and 8. Yes? There will be essay questions on your exam. Check your email. Yes. So we're going over 11, but it's on the Correct. The nervous system I, I do all together. So 11, 12, 13, 14, that's your next test. And that's a doozy. That's the reason I, we do this. The reason we don't wait till the end of the semester. If I have to cram a chapter down your throat, Chapter 5 is not really a bad chapter to cram down your throat. Yes? It's, it's fairly simple compared to what, what, after you get past the nervous system, it's a fairly simple chapter. And the muscles, not going to be so hard either. Because we're not in lecture going to memorize all of the muscles. You are just um, going to be tested on muscle physiology. Okay? So that's not bad. All right. Let's do the click a question. The site where two or more bones meet. So does everybody understand what's going to be on the exam? Okay. A bunch of stuff. How many questions do you have? I don't know. It, uh, well, yeah, pretty much. Because we're not going to go into the joints all, no, we're not going to do that. Oh, no, oh, by the way, wait a minute. You should know um, a little bit about the homeostatic imbalances of joints. So basic definitions about strains, cartilage tears, dislocations, bursitis, tendonitis, arthritis. And yeah, so that is also going to be on the exam. So what's the answer? The answer is D. Oh yeah, quick, another quick announcement. If you have Marilyn Smith for lab today, well, it w it w no, you wouldn't be in her 10 o'clock lab. If you have Marilyn Smith today for lab at 6 p.m., she had to cancel lab, so she will not be there. But if you would like to go to other labs that meet today, you are welcome to do that. Um, for you guys, it would be second week of histology for tissue, yes? So if you want to go to another lab, you're welcome to do that. And I think she'll probably make arrangements for you to catch up somehow.